Although it's now approaching its 60th birthday, our home city of Milton Keynes is still thought of as a new town, one of a number in the UK in the post-war era, and of course in countries around the world. To talk about several of them, the common challenges they face and the approaches they're taking to tackling them, we're delighted to welcome two of the leading commentators on the building environment, urban design and placemaking. Owen Hathaway and John Grindrod. Owen Hathaway writes about aesthetics and politics for the Architectural Review, The Guardian, and the London Review of Books, amongst others. He is the author of many books, most recently Modern Buildings in Britain, A Gazetteer, and Artificial Islands, uh, which won Best Book and Best Monograph at the 2023 Architectural Book Awards. And Transitional Objects, Photographs of Poland, uh, last year. He's a commissioning editor at Jacobin. John Grindrod is a social historian of modern places. He's the author of Concretopia, A Journey Around the Rebuilding of Post-War Britain, Outskirts, Living Life on the Edge of the Greenbelt, and Iconicon, A Journey Around the Landmark Buildings of Contemporary Britain. He's a resident of Milton Keynes and is a good friend of MK Litfest. Just a few points of housekeeping before we begin. As a courtesy to them and to each other, please can you stay muted while our guests are in conversation. We also are recording tonight's event, so uh, remain in full view if you wish. Uh, turn off your camera if you wish to. And you are, of course, welcome to add your questions and comments in the chat window or use the Zoom the Zoom reactions options. We'll post links to online resources about and by our guests during the event as well uh, in the chat. At which point, let us begin and welcome you to Dirty Newtown, Litfest look at new towns and new cities around the world. And I will hand over to John and Owen to take us through the next 45 minutes. Hello. Um, thank you all for coming along. Look at you all at home. This is quite exciting. Normally, you don't never get to see people in the in these things in an online talk. So it's really nice to actually see actual people in actual homes. Uh, so that's nice. And uh, and look at us in our actual homes as well. And uh, uh, so that's good. We are uh, Owen and I are both massive post-war architecture geeks. I think we both sort of got into. Um, uh, got into sort of the subject um, through a kind of personal sort of fascination with it. And um, we have both written quite a lot about new town. So this feels like a really nice opportunity to talk about, uh, to talk about the sort of new town projects around the world, uh, which are really varied and interesting. And, uh, and quite a lot of them are, you know, some of the stuff we're going to talk about this evening is not particularly like massively well known in Britain, where I think we're quite, you know, we've uh, we're more aware of sort of the, maybe the new towns in Britain uh, than we are with other ones around the world. Um, one of the things I'm particularly fascinated about with new towns is that they offer a sort of snapshot um, of how we should live, taken from a particular moment in time. And I think that I think that is particularly sort of fascinating about them. And uh, I'm I guess more of a I have more experience of, of British new towns. Owen uh, has written about uh, and travelled to new towns around the world. So we're going to have a bit of a kind of explore of different places today. Um, and uh, we we basically we chose we chose sort of three main places to talk about. Um, uh, we're going to talk about um, uh, Nova Huta in Poland. Um, we're going to talk about Cumbernauld in Scotland. Uh, we're going to talk about Tama in Japan. And we're also threading through it, going to be talking about Milton Keynes, uh, which is where I am now. So uh, so just take it as read that Milton Keynes is, is the wallpaper. I mean, literally my wallpaper, but it's literally the wallpaper uh, of, of, the, of the talk too. So um, maybe it sort of makes sense to start with the first one of these towns that was um that was actually commissioned which was you know, the Hitler in Poland um I mean you um you have 
travelled there and written about it before. Um, it's the one of the social realist towns. Can you tell me what what that is? Yeah, so I suppose my, my interest in the Hood series partly it makes quite a good wind up for a certain way of of how people sort of see new towns in Britain and what went wrong with them, which is generally rightly or wrongly they're a bit too modernist. Um, you know, it was all a bit too it was all a bit too new and novel, and it didn't really connect with earlier building traditions that wasn't traditional urbanism there was too much space there was too much kind of grade separation walkways subways underpasses it should have been more like a historic european city and when that first generation of new towns are being built you know the ones around the, the kind of the immediate post-war ones so the kind of ring of the like of, like the sort of stevenage crawley harlow around london Peterley in the northeast, um, East Kilbride in Scotland, Cumbran in Wales, and so on. Around the time that they're being built, um, in the Eastern Bloc, they're doing their own new towns. And they'd actually done in the early 30s, the Soviet Union had done quite modernist new towns. They're kind of like the first kind of really big new towns of the 20th century, probably maybe outside the US. Uh, are in the USSR and they get in kind of Bauhaus designers and so on to design them. And it doesn't go very well. And they, you know, they're kind of lost in the midst of time, really. But after the war, a lot more of them are built. And by this point, the Soviets have kind of gone through this whole kind of metamorphosis from being these big sponsors of modernism to being the biggest anti-modernists going. So the idea is that Rather than this kind of idea that the socialist future would be something kind of new and futuristic and wouldn't be like the old ways, it's more like, I think that the phrase that was used, I can't remember who, I think by um, Anatoly Lunacharsky, who was the Minister of Culture, rather the, the Commissar of Enlightenment in the Soviet Union in the 30s, said that the people have earned their right to Corinthian colonnades. And so that's what they got in Novohuta. So I want to show one kind of picture of it first to kind of, kind of get an idea of what what I'm talking about. So I'm going to share my screen just for a couple of minutes. Uh, la, 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 la. Share screen. There you go. So this is the kind of like, um, you know, the be careful what you wish for version of um, the post for new towns. So Nova Hutsa is about 10 miles out of Krakow. Mm -hmm. um, which was a town the communists were kind of suspicious of because the sort of historic Polish capital, the intelligentsia were very strong there, who tended to be a bit distrustful um, of the communists for fairly obvious reasons. Um, but also it didn't have much of an industrial working class. And they very much thought, kind of wrongly it would turn out, but they thought that the industrial working class would support them. And in some parts of Poland, they kind of had over the years, like a lot of the mining areas that had quite a bit of support. So what they decided to do was about 10 miles outside of Krakow, build a gigantic steel mill and then build a town around it. So Novogutsa, roughly speaking, translated as new mill. So it's pretty straightforward. It's, it's a mill of a town attached. But when they were designing it, they decided it should kind of follow lots of the principles of the design of Krakow itself. So... It's got these um, colonnades that you can see here. It's got these kind of decorative Renaissance um, kind of surrounds and so forth around the windows. It's got these kind of attics that are based on 16th century Polish architecture. Um, the only thing it really lacks, which you would find in historic buildings in Poland, is colour. Um, so the only bit of it that's kind of what I think people think the Eastern Bloc is like is that it's incredibly grey. But in every other regard, it's kind of the thing that people that, you know, think that um, we should have built traditional new towns. It's kind of, it's it's the, you know, it's the road not taken, basically. So it's kind of interesting on that, on that level. Yeah, and I, it's sort of interesting when you see the sort of road layouts of the sort of centre, sort mm. of radial design, you know, it's sort of somewhere between sort of, Letchworth and Paris, you know, it's yeah, kind of, yeah, you know, it's sort yeah. of like, you know, whereas Letchworth is a sort of dinky kind of, you know, everything's quite small, and obviously Paris, everything is sort of, mm. you know, the, the scale is sort of somewhere between that, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, and you know, it's 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 
it's all the kind of stuff that really for since the late 90s we've been told we should do everywhere it's it's big boulevards yeah it's big boulevards of lots of trees and shops on the ground floor yeah. and 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 you know it doesn't really have anything any of the complex and fiddly stuff that new towns have in in britain at the same time um no underpasses no walkways none of that yeah um but it does have public buildings and this is kind of where where the story kind of gets sort of um fun and interesting is that one of the really important things about nova Huta early on was that it's going to be the first polish town about church as this country which historically you know was very 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 catholic um it was quite a kind of statement of like it would have everything else there's a tr traditional polish kind of touches in the design but it wouldn't have churches so the kind of an initial center is these public buildings of which i want to show one um because it's got this lovely 60s neon sign on it um going to share the screen again it's quite a bad picture so bear with me um so this is um this was built around the time that the town was built during the 1950s there's these kind of theaters and houses of culture that are kind of built um at the sort of center of various of the main squares and at kind of points where the roads meet um and this is a uh, theater ludovia which is roughly speaking the people's theater um and the sign is obviously later the sign is this really delightful jazzy kind of 60s 70s sign i got really obsessed um in the few years i spent traveling around poland in the early 2010s with signs it's amazing neon signs but anyway so this was kind of supposed to be the center was that you would kind of go and you would enjoy culture you would go to the library you would go to the theater you would go to the cinema but you wouldn't go to church um bishop of krakow at the time was a guy called karol Wojtyla, who is better known as pope john paul ii and he was also really into modern architecture so you get this quite fun thing that happens again that kind of scrambles the a lot of the um chronology um in 1953 stalin dies um in 1956 there's a big liberalization in poland um and one of the upshots of that is that you can build churches again basically um so in nova Huta in particular the people who've kind of moved to the city usually from rural areas to work in the steelworks um you know they want a church they're devout catholic polish rural folk um and the bishop of krakow um happens to be a big enthusiast for modern architecture um vatican ii the kind of second back to vatican council is about to happen so they build over many years quite kind of slowly because the state denies it a lot of resources this incredible almost kind of cathedral scale church which is of course no, no it's the wrong picture sorry <laughs> amateurism amateurism um there we are so can you see this has the church actually come up or have i buggered it up no that's great excellent so um so you know that the, the 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 kind of church and the people kind of collaborate on this on this project to kind of enliven Nova Hutter and have what they really want at the center of it, and that happens to be this Le Corbusier inspired, incredibly modernist church at an elevated level above the rest of the town. So another kind of fun thing about Nova Hutter for me is that it's kind of you know. The people, the people make their opinions known, and what they actually want is modernism and the church. And it's so interesting, isn't it? That moment that you talk about, that where suddenly people are looking outside of Poland for inspiration because they can, mm -hmm. um, and that you know, there's a bit of kind of importing of of sort of housing ideas from Scandinavia and, and as well, isn't there? At the same time, yeah. So just kind of north of the kind of grand boulevards that were built at the turn of the 50s there's quite a lot of little quite small little kind of public housing towers and green space um again the sort of stuff that later people are gonna would look at and go oh that's so soviet but what it actually comes from as you say is people actually could leave poland so they went to things like 
Tapiola in Finland, Stevenage, and places like that. And we're like, why don't we do something like this rather than boulevards, which we find rather kind of bleak and oppressive? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's kind of that real thing of like, you know, there's a lot of kind of eye of the beholder going on in a lot of this. Um, that a particular form can look, you know, sort of oppressive or or, or kind of liberating and very much depending on who's looking and when. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And sort of like in terms of sort of sort of transport, sort of infrastructure there, I mean, is it sort of, you know, the Grand Boulevard lends itself hugely to kind of thundering cars, Ooh. you know, and, um, but is it, is it that, or is there sort of a lot of public transport? I mean, how is that? What, what does it feel like to kind of walk around? Yeah, I mean, um, the, the one of the main boulevards, the one that I showed of the colonnades, is actually pedestrianised mm -hmm. in a classic Newtown style, and I think always was. So there's a kind of cent that's where they put the Lenin statue at the start. It, Poland, even in the communist era, didn't have many Lenin statues, but Lenin had actually lived in Krakow for a bit, so he got a statue, um, which obviously yep. was taken down after 1989. Although the last time I was there about six or seven years ago, um, there was still a, like, a little dinky statue of him in a, in a cafe. Um, but um, but yeah, that, that was pedestrianised, whereas the rest, lots of cars, particularly as the kind of suburbs of Krakow kind of grew to the point where they kind of start to absorb Nova Horta a bit. Um, it's kind of, you know, more of a kind of Hemel Hempstead than a Milton Keynes, as it were. Like, it's the line between it and, and the city is quite blurred now. Um, but the um, the tram network, the Krakow tram network goes out there. Right. So it actually has quite a lot of trams going through it. So the trans public transport is fairly good and reliable. Yeah. Um, because Krakow has this very, very good tram network that it just kind of, you know, at a certain point they extended it out there and so it's okay, surprisingly. Yeah. And sort of industry-wise, it's kind of gone from steel to steel fags and cement, which is kind of, uh, you know, a nice trio of sort of super macho industries. Yes. <laughs> Very <laughs> Polish. Um, yeah. And um, in terms of the kind of population, has it sort of changed over time? Has it been kind of like absorbed more within Krakow? Has it become a bit more, you know, a, a bit more mixed or is it still very working class it's still very working class um but um my information on it is a little bit dated because i've not been there in a little while um i've always kind of wondered if the, it would get to the point where um you know kind of hipsters of which there are plenty in krakow um would go and live there yeah and the music festival Unsound, which takes place every year in the autumn in Krakow, um, started a little while back to um, to use some of the public buildings in Nova Huta for you know. I saw I saw swans in Nova Huta in about twenty fifteen, the, <laughs> the eighties industrial band Swans. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think anywhere where the, where you can go to a Swans gig is going to have hipsters in it. Absolutely. Extraordinary hair going on, you'd hope. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So, um, so I mean, maybe we should leave leave Poland and move on to our next town and then we can kind of sort of maybe sort of draw them all together mm. as we go on. And the next one that's designated is Cumbernauld in Scotland, which is designated in 1955. Um, and is, you know, it's a, you know, it's a really fascinating place. Obviously, I have been to Cumbernauld and... The, you know, the the kind of disjunct between the centre and the outskirts of the town is is more pronounced, I think, than you know almost anywhere that I've been, other than maybe Poundbury, you know, yeah. in terms of a giant out of scale sort of size and uh, and low and low level. I mean, you're knowing this better than me, I think, but it's always struck me as a place that has two totally parallel tracks. There's the kind of housing, which, you know, kind of picks up where the 50s new towns left off. And, you know, it's um, it's quite kind of in a very slightly kind of dour Scottish Presbyterian way. It's very nice. Mm. Um, it's very Scandinavian. There's a lot of green space that uses the hills and the landscape in a really mm. interesting way. My favourite thing about Cumbernauld by far is all of the kind of little landscape touches. 
Mm. And then you've got this center that is this extraordinary, and I have to say with reluctance, utterly failed experiment. Um, and I've always wondered whether those, those two groups of people were even talking to each other. Yeah, and that does seem a peculiarly British thing in this period, actually, among design, is that you you kind of look at, you know, the, the Federal of Britain or, you know, the London County Council or wherever, and they seem to be kind of like opposing teams who, who hate one another, don't talk to one another, and yeah. seem to kind of work to kind of spite one another and, you know, undermine one another as far as they can. And I remember reading that there was a moment where Copcut, who designed the sort of centre, Geoffrey Copcut, they basically flipped a coin to decide which team would design the housing and which team would design the centre, and he got the centre. <laughs> um, and that's how that happened. It just seems kind of an extraordinary, you know, arbitrary decision that that would happen. It didn't come from a from a place of, I am, you know, I'm a passionate, you know, expert about this thing. I've kind of grown up sort of, you know, with this is my speciality, and I'm doing... It was kind of like, yeah, whatever, just give me the task and I'll do I'll do my thing. And it, it sort of feels a bit like these are architects who were doing their thing, you know. It's sort of quite yeah. interesting like that. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, so the, it's kind of one of those places where I think the idea that people... Of all of the new towns, it has the biggest gulf between what people think it is and what it is, yeah. I think. Yeah. Like, and the one reason for that is the view that you get when you get off the railway station, which is one picture, I, one, one image I want to show. Because um, I just remember just getting off it in January, it would have been maybe January 2012. Uh -huh. The first thing you see is this. So you get this kind of view of like these kind of repeated blocks and concrete and tile quite stained looking pretty forlorn mm. this kind of long building which could be a presbyterian church or could be a leisure center or could be an incinerator you just don't know and snow and just this real thing of like a lot that a lot of housing has in central scotland that it's really <laughs> aggressively grim and then you kind of walk through it a bit and loads of it's actually like Well, like, no, let me just check the screen again. Like this. So, you know, again, the housing's in that kind of central Scotland thing where everything's kind of grey and pebble dashed. A lot of the windows are a bit smaller. Though by central Scotland standards, these are actually really big windows. <laughs> Um, so it's still got that kind of vibe of like, you're not supposed to enjoy it too much, but there's these really kind of subtle little landscape touches and this kind of lovely paving and the green space is all very well worked out. If you try and ignore the wheelie bins, which I always, I've kind of developed like a wheelie bin blind spot where I just don't see this in pictures anymore. Um, but the only way. yeah, that, that, um, it's suddenly quite nice. Yeah, that, that sort of obsession with hill towns of the kind of modernist of that period is sort of particularly, you know, is is actually really embraced in a in a way that makes sense actually in in, mm. in a way that quite often, you know, people are trying to kind of do a hill town on a very gentle slope somewhere that actually, you know, no, no, <laughs> that doesn't <laughs> work. Um, but um, but there it does work, and I think as you said, you know, the landscape touches are sort of amazing you know and also the use of kind of um sort of cobbles and and sort of different materials so that you you're sort of you're sort of moved around the landscape by quite an interesting sort of palette of different stuff you know yeah, there's almost sort of bits where like there's just suddenly like this almost kind of hill of cobbles to kind of go not over there you go through here yeah absolutely and a lot yeah. of things are very authoritarian just done in this way that's kind of cute like there's one there's one underpass which I just think is so kind of almost kind of hobbit like, um, which I'll show a picture of. See, this is what you get with with a uh, Milton Keynes Literature Festival talk is a, a a screen sharing of underpasses in in Cumbernauld. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that that's amazing, isn't it? I know. Like Milton Keynes could never. 
no, 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 no. We're not having anything that irrational going on. Thank you. But it has a similar thing to Milton Keynes underpasses that you can see who's at the other end, mm. which is a really obvious thing in underpasses that you'd think they all had, but most of them don't. No, no. That, um, there's, that, there's a sort of. I think when you get into the centre of Milton Keynes, you have those underpasses where you go down them, and then you're sort of like in a little landscape of underpasses, which is a bit disconcerting. Yeah, I think that's the only point where I think the underpasses sort of feel suddenly a bit threatening. They otherwise you do you're just through them very quickly. You don't you don't you're not sort of dwelling in them. Uh, yeah. I mean, you literally look like you could dwell in that one. I mean, that <laughs> did exactly. a little bit could be. Yeah, yeah, it turned into a house quite nicely. Um, um, so you've got this kind of like, you know, sort of, I think sort of, if Finland was, in, was Presbyterian and damp kind of town on the one hand, and then you've got this kind of deranged centre, which mm. I've always really wanted to like. Yeah. And I kind of feel that if I'd gone there, like just kind of fifteen years earlier, I would have done like a whole apologist thing for why it's actually brilliant. But by the time I went, I just couldn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think I I spoke to John Knight, who was one of the architects who was working on the centre, and I remember he was saying that he had like loads of arguments with Jeffrey Cupcut about you know he was trying to they were trying to do things like cinemas where you couldn't do them because the 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 supporting columns of the megastructure meant that you couldn't, there was no way you could get a clear view. Mm. Um, so things like that were sort of like undermining it. But he lived in one of the penthouse flats that was on the top. Yeah. And and he was sort of talking about, you know, what it was like living in the centre of, of Cumbernauld in those flats and, and how amazing they were. And it was a, it was a sort of, it was quite a, a sort of invigorating vision of this sort of modernist, paradise that had been built up there you know and it was very Ballardian you know it was the, you know the architect living at the top of the building looking at you know but yeah, at the same yeah. time he was you know he was pretty racy and he kind of you know he was kind of enjoying driving around in his sports car around town in a you know he was um you know he he was quite a sort of you know fun sort of non you know it wasn't like one of those you know sort of a Ballardian architect you know where you're you know sort of like very grim you know and it's sort of interesting you sort of really infused it with so much color and personality and mm. i think at that moment it sort of begun to make sense but it that is a sort of fleeting moment that then wasn't allowed to kind of continue and you mm. know but those you know those penthouse flats sort of fell into disuse or they were reused as storage or whatever you know they suddenly the whole massive bits of it don't make sense and it sort yeah. of feels like it fails in chunks that sense doesn't it you know yeah. bit whole bit of it will suddenly fail and become unusable yeah i think we should probably there's like a, probably a, a, a minority but nonetheless a minority that exists who don't know what it looks like so i'm gonna gonna throw some particularly particularly dreek um Cumberland old town center at them um so what it looked like, what it looked like about nine years ago is this and that was an effort of so that's that's your that's your penthouses there, isn't it? The is, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. On their on their leg. So, so that's you and you kind of have to hunt quite a bit to find it because I've always thought there's a kind of like be careful what you wish for thing with Cumbernauld, because the whole idea, which in many ways comes from Japan, is this idea that you would kind of have these sorts of buildings that you could kind of plug bits into and kind of capsule could go here and a capsule could go there. And you can put one, take one bit out and put another bit in. And that's exactly what happened in Cumbernauld, but in such a way that the original building just got eaten by all of this rubbish, just absolutely dreadful, dreadful architecture that just kind of nibbled away at it. But um, I don't, I mean, I, I, I've seen examples of very, very similar buildings that work quite well. Mm. Um, the one that always comes to mind is the one in Seoul in South Korea, which was built a couple of years later, I, I think probably ripping it off in many ways, um, which quite recently got kind of restored in a quite subtle way, not in a kind of like big, let's clean it up and make it like the Barbican and make it nice way, but in a like, it's become a bit weird and a bit cranky and we're going to leave it like that, but clean it up. Um, and it works really well. And I think one of the real problems with Cumbernauld which is also a problem of Milton Keynes, but one which Milton Keynes has been able to ride out for one reason or another to a certain degree, is that it's the town centre that 
became treated as a mall. And it's supposed to be a town centre. It's supposed to do all the things a town centre does. Um, it's supposed to be a multifunctional building that's got your, your shops, but has also got a leisure centre that also supposed to be a right of way that's supposed to be have, you know, supposed to all of these things at once. And so therefore has to be in public ownership. And in the 80s and 90s, these things all get sold off. Mm. And so you're left with this thing that just makes no sense as a shopping mall. Like, if you were going to build a shopping mall, you wouldn't build it like that. Like uh, so, I mean, there was a, one of my one of my favorite buildings being from being from South Hampshire when I was growing up at the Tricon Centre in Portsmouth, and um, someone I know who was involved in the campaign to save it, which fell a bit too early. Like it was at the point where I don't think even the twentieth century society were advocating the Tricon to be saved. You know, it was just it was too it was too edgy even at the time. It was like the great thing about the Tricon is it puts people off shopping. And that's great, but also that's the reason why the Tricon got demolished. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it sort of, as you say, edgy is the is the word, isn't it? Like, they, it, you know, some of these places sort of just become slightly too, you know, for the size of the building and the amount of businesses it needs to actually encourage and sort of allow to kind of flourish within it to keep going in that way, it it's too, you know, it becomes too kind of edgy. And it's interesting, the, you know, the shopping centre of Milton Keynes, the sort of, you know, the, you know, the central building is still very well used. And even though, you know, there's a lot of kind of moaning about, oh, well, you know, this unit's empty or that unit's empty, because there never used to be any empty units, you know, sort of famously used to be sort of always full. Um, um, it's still actually functions as mm. as a mall and is still kind of shiny and you know still feels like a like a contemporary building it doesn't feel like it's sort of slid uncomfortably into into sort of another era in a way that mm. um, some of these other buildings have really and then you know you go around you know you go around the the mega structure in in Cumbernauld and it you know, you are on various kind of brown tiled levels, you know, kind of wondering where you where you are. Am I on the where can I get? And sort of almost the place you don't want to be is on the ground floor, because when you get to the ground floor, you can't really get out. So you're, you know, it is, it's so confusing, you know, and there is an interesting thing about, you know, people sort of saying that modernism, you know, was all about, you know, had so much kind of uh, emphasis on functionalism that actually everything was sort of too simple and I think when you see buildings like the mega structure in Cumberland mm. or the Tricorn you you can absolutely see that that is not always the case and I think there's a kind of there's a a willful version of modernism that that actually is in a lot of places that isn't that isn't that that isn't that idea of functionalism. The, the Tricorn at the end had um, a goth record shop and a branch of Laser Quest. There we are. So, that, and that's the kind of thing it was. That's the kind of thing it was, you know. And, and people that loved it at that point were goths, and yeah. people that liked to play Laser Quest. And yeah. so, and the goth never went to Laser Quest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Two very separate <laughs> groups. But the, but that kind of thing of like you know that, um, if it being very irrational, mm. is a, is is, I think a thing that a lot of sixties modernism does kind of deliberately. And I think, you know. There's a lot of talk of kind of labyrinths and caspers and so on at that point. And because of in reaction to things like Stevenage. Yeah. Because Stevenage looks so simple, you know, it's kind of houses and lawns and, you know, cycle paths and it's very nice. But I think architecture so architectural association trained architects looked at Stevenage and were like, I don't want to live here. Yeah. Um, and there's lots of the story of I think of people of places like Cumbernauld and Thamesmead as architects trying to design places where they actually would want to live, mm -hmm. um, which I suppose is a bit counterintuitive to how I think people, you know, to the fact that they were actually living in Georgian houses as well. So, but anyway. Well, let's leave <laughs> Scotland and let's go to Japan, um, to our, our, our sort of final new town that we we're going to talk about, which was um, Tama. So tell me about tell me about Tama. So when, when did you when did you go there? So I went there um, last May or June. I can't remember which. Um, I'm kind of planning a a thing <laughs> about a, a, about Northeast Asia, um, which I'm sort of been working on for the last year or so, and that's involved some travel out there. 
Um, and a while back, someone told me, this is one of those, like, someone told me that someone told them type stories. Um, but someone told me that they'd been at a housing conference in the 80s um, with a Japanese delegate who had come up to them and said, do you know about Hook Newtown? And he happened to know about Hook Newtown, which, you know, for 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 those that aren't the true heads, um, Hook is an unbuilt GLC Newtown that was going to be in Hampshire, um, but was shelved because of the opposition of Hampshire County Council. And the actual design informed the design of Thamesmead quite a lot. And it was like, yeah, I know about Hook Newtown. And the guy from Japan said, did you know that we built it? I've got a moment, mine just here. Yeah. Way, there we are. We can have a hook book off. We've all got a copy of the hook book. <laughs> um, I can pull it out. <laughs> it's just magnificent stuff. Um, I mean, pure happiness in a book. It really is. Just like trying to find a particular, but it, it's very, it's very kind of multi-level and very very urban and very dense and very kind of. Very not like Stevenage, um, but also not like Milton Keynes. So, like, you know, yeah. this sort of thing. Um, so this, so I've been kind of since finding this, like he said, she said type story out. I was like, I wonder where in Japan they actually built Hook, and I don't know if I found it. I did go to two new towns, um, to Tama. Um, which is about 20 miles outside of Tokyo, and to Shonandai, which is about 10 miles out of Yokohama. Mm -hmm. And um, neither of them quite looked like Hook, but Tama was the one that looked most like Hook. Yeah. Um, so I was like, you know, this is this, this, this would be an interesting one to talk about. So in terms of its time, it's a bit more around the time of Milton Keynes, slightly earlier. So it's planned from early 60s onwards. Most of the building takes place in the 70s. Um, and the centre is built quite late. So the centre is um, about 83, 84. Right. And so Tama, pretty much like every other new town of the era, um, there's kind of light industry, um, it's mainly kind of, you know, it's a public project. A lot of it's public housing, which is there's never as much in Japan as there is in um, the UK, but there's a fair bit. Um, and there's this kind of multi-level centre. One of the industries that um, moved to Tama is a company called Sanrio, um, who are best known for their invention around the time that Tama gets finished of Hello Kitty. So it's got the Hello Kitty factory. Um, and it also has in the center of town, Hello Kitty World. So most of it's a dormitory town and a kind of very ordinary kind of working class, low middle class new town. But there's this trickle of tourists who are always getting off at Tama Station going to Hello Kitty World. Um, there's kind of one corner of the town center that's been kind of made about Hello Kitty, but that's not what I'm going to show. What I'm going to show is the Parthenon as it's called. Ah, uh, yes. Um, so this is this is the town centre that's built in the in the early 80s, is around the Parthenon, which I'm going to show if I can get this to work. Um, oh, what have I done wrong? Um, we haven't got time for that, Owen. <laughs> I've ruined it, I've ruined it. <laughs> um, so, oh, yes, here we are. So... Here we have the Parthenon. Hey. Um, so um, it's not really the Parthenon, but it's a kind of very, very weird 1980s megastructure. So kind of unlike the UK, Japan continues building megastructures, as I would understand them at any rate, throughout the 80s, but they no longer kind of, they're no longer made of concrete, they're no longer kind of brutalist. They tend to be POMO, but they have much the same thing. So this is a combined museum, library, town hall, leisure centre, the lot, much like in Cumbernauld. Um, it's elevated above the town. So the main service road for um, goes under this. So this is a public bridge come plaza um, with motorway underneath it. Um, and the steps 
go up to this park, which I think is extremely Milton Keynes. Um, apart from the high rise, obviously. Yeah, it's sort of like Milton Keynes, but any sort of eight bit version of Milton. Yeah, Keynes. exactly. Um, I mean, Nintendo were in Kyoto, unfortunately, but it does. It's very much that era. Um, that so that that the colonnade you could see um, on the left is the is the Parthenon itself. So the Parthenon doesn't do anything. There's these kind of two flanking blocks, which is where the things actually are, and that's just a sort of decoration. Mm -hmm. um, so it's got this again. It's got this very kind of flamboyant, multi-level, megastructural, but all of the kind of you know, a lot of the sort of modernist and futurist rhetoric has kind of been dropped. Yeah. Um, into this kind of more sort of Super Mario World type aesthetic, but the housing is more like this. So, um, which is really radically unlike anything being done in in Britain at the time or anywhere. So most of what's built, public or private, is single family housing. So straightforward, detached, usually detached houses for one family. But in order to fill the space, um, you know, it's a very, very densely populated country with not a lot of areas that you can build on. So there's not a lot of space for everyone to have their own driveway and front and back garden and loads of space around it. So everyone has, or not everyone, but about three quarters of the residents have a single family house, which is just, which is prefabricated and packed into this tiny, tiny space. Um, and then around that, you get these larger blocks, which you can see in the background, which are much more sort of standard. 70s public housing mm. so there's this very weird combination of in some ways sort of doing what Milton Keynes was doing of like one to, everyone's going to get a house but in a very 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 different way and radically unsentimental you know everything's thrown together here with the motorway viaduct the power lines the high rises they're all just shoved together in a way that you just wouldn't get anywhere in Europe really and then this is taken from um, the main public transport, which is, of course, a monorail. Um, because, you know, if you're going to build a, a futuristic new town, it has to have a monorail. Now, don't rub it in just because we didn't have <laughs> um, And again, you kind of get this, you know, you sort of start from this quite kind of low density, kind of spacious centre around the, around the so-called Parthenon. Get on the monorail above all of these little houses. And then you come to one of the kind of sub centers. So this is kind of like one of those bits of Milton Keynes, which has got, you know, a, a supermarket and a chicken cottage and, you know, a few other kind of units at a pub. And this is kind of the Tamar equivalent. Um, so again, a kind of level of density and modernity that you really wouldn't get anywhere else in the eighties and nineties when this is being finished. Um, so there's a kind of, sense of it some of the same kind of problems and, and questions of like flats or houses or green space or no green space public transport or private transport they're all kind of being asked in japan but they're being answered in quite a different way yeah it's interesting isn't it and actually this i mean this image really reminds me of um you know of bits of docklands actually you know there, there are kind of bits of docklands where you've got the light railway and you've got kind of like things happening at kind of like odd levels next to it yeah and again, that is a lot because a lot of the people that worked on Milton Keynes then worked on on that early sort of development corporation bit of Docklands. Mm -hmm. um, there are kind of all sorts of mirrors of Milton Keynes there as well, which is sort of makes those early bits of Docklands sort of feel quite peculiar in a way because mm -hmm. they, mm -hmm. they um, they're out of scale with the mega Docklands that happens a bit yeah. later. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and. It, the form of the town is really interesting, isn't it? Because it's incredibly, it's sort of long, isn't it? It's sort of like a linear town rather than yeah. a, a sort of circular. Yeah, like a lot of the, there was a big thing in the kind of towns that were proposed and sometimes built in the USSR in the early 30s, is that they'd be linear, just mm. sort of a strip along the railway. Yeah. And in Japan, you kind of have to do that because after a certain point, you reach the mountains. Yeah. Um, in Tamar on a sunny day, you can see Mount Fuji. But um, it wasn't a sunny day. I've got some pictures of Mount Fuji in the background, but it it <laughs> looks a, it looks a bit treak as treak as Cumbernauld. Steady. <laughs> the um, I mean, actually, it being sort of a linear town makes the monorail much more you know 
much more plausible and kind of useful as a as a way of getting around the town itself rather than just being something that you get on to get out of the town. Yeah. Um, the problem that towns like Milton Keynes have with public transport like that is because it's, you know, such a sort of circular town, it, you know, and it's on the grid where, you know, you can't do them, you know, like they're just sort of interesting sort of, you know, philosophical issues there with the sort of basic form of the town which means that public transport is just suddenly more difficult as a result. And it's interesting that that in a way that the, you know, the the infrastructure of the sort of transport there is sort of in, as embedded in the kind of footprint of the town as it is in Milton Keynes, but with a totally different um, outcome. Yeah. And where they've built the roads, it's generally, you've got, a, they've been elevated. Yeah. Again, because of that, that question of how it's the sort of strip. So yeah, you've had to, everything's had, had to be made, made multi-level. Yeah. And yeah. probably they could have used that space in a different way and made it more kind of green and spacious and more roady if they hadn't also had a commitment to put most people in houses. Yeah. And that just meant it had to be so insanely dense. And that's the thing that fascinates me about it. It's kind of like, so this is what you say you want. Well, this is what it's going to look like. Yeah, yeah. And there's sort of bits of it that I've seen where um the you know, they're sort of like low rise blocks of flats in a very kind of simple sort of Bauhaus style, actually, mm -hmm. sort of Absolutely. like in a, in a in a you know, in a sort of um herringbone kind of layout. And um and again, incredibly densely packed, you know, mm -hmm. not just three or four of them, but you know, whole units of of sort of tens of them all mm -hmm. next to one another, which is, you know, it's creates a really odd landscape to actually have you know with those the houses all kind of put together like that where they're all tessellated in a very dense way and then the sort of tessellation of the flats where they've got a bit more space around them but they're still actually all weaving in and out of one another you know it feels like it's almost like a logic problem trying to kind of put those things together rather than a town planning sort of solution it's mm -hmm. it's you know it's more it's more like maths has gone on yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah, which is really interesting. Now, I know that um, quite a lot of people in the chat have been um, uh, asking questions and people do mm -hmm. want to ask questions and, 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 and get involved. So we should we should definitely do that. I mean, I think, you know, I do think one of the interesting things about New Town, just that I do give you a snapshot of, of, you know, a particular moment in time, as I said at the, the beginning. Um, and of these towns, it feels like some of them are sort of stuck in that moment sort of primarily and some of them have sort of moved on I feel like you know Milton Keynes is you know is sort of strangely kind of of its time but also is still moving on because actually a lot of that fashion for stuff that was happening in at the point where Milton Keynes was sort of growing is still the orthodoxy in a, in a lot of senses with um the way that house building is done but um it doesn't feel like there are a lot of other places like, as you said, there's not really a lot of other places like like Tamar, is there? I mean, that's quite unusual. Yeah, although I think a lot of Japanese dormitory towns have a sort of dominance of public transport, which is really yeah. um, impressive. Yeah. And I think part of it is geography, but part of it is just a somewhat different sense of priorities, really. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then Cumbernauld is sort of, you know, there's, I mean, constantly kind of like knocking bits of it down in the centre and kind of threatening other bits and, and kind of that all that stuff happens quite slowly. But mm -hmm. maybe, maybe they will kind of move on from that, from that kind of, you know, central megastructure. And that will sort of create a different town and that that will completely change the atmosphere of the whole town, I think, having a different town centre there. Um uh, I mean, going back to um, Nova Huta, which we talked about at the beginning, you know, that is interesting what you were saying there, that it's it has developed, you know, like there have been kind of reactions against that idea of, um, you know, the sort of historic um, references at the beginning. And is it still moving? Is it still changing? Like the, um, the, the I, I... The the la most kind of recent major buildings in Nova Huta are some Pomo flats from the late eighties, early nineties, which are wild. Um, really, really fun. Um, kind of you know the whole kind of pale pink um, type thing, pale pink and sky blue. Um, but since then, I don't really think there's much there. I think the main square is now listed. 
Right. Um, so actually, and it, the church is certainly listed, so you can't really bugger about with it. Right. Um, and I think that, you know, a lot of that kind of the, the, so, the socialist realists, classical architecture of Poland from that time, kind of, in some cases, got listed before the modernism that came after it because of the fact that it's much more in tune with, you know, kind of current ideology about how cities should be built, which is like they were in the 19th century, basically. Yeah. Um, so it's actually, of all, it's, it's a new town that's very, very kind of close to being preserved in Aspic, really. Um, there's very, very little new development, and um, far less than in um, somewhere like Milton Keynes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Where everything feels like it has a has a lifespan of ten years and beyond that, you're lucky. Mm -hmm. Which is much more like how things are done in Japan. Which is, if something doesn't work, you just knock it down straight away. Yeah, but before on. it's had a chance to work in some. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Bye. Oh, uh, yeah. There we are. Anyway, um, John Best, um, I think you were gonna you were gonna say whether there are any any. Yes. Well, I'm looking yeah. at the that's been a, a fabulous conversation, and there may be yet more to come. Um, the, the, a couple of points that were raised by people, a lot of reminiscences raised in the chat rather than what I would regard as being leading questions. Um, one very interesting one from Alan Cochrane, which is, uh, I don't know if Alan's still on the call and would like to, to raise his point, but it was um, exploring whether all new towns worth their salt have their own iconic feature film in their portfolio, Cumbernauld having Gregory's Girl and yeah. wondering what the best choice for Milton Keynes would be. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, because Studio Ghibli have done some Tama stuff, haven't they? Oh, I was going to say, um, there's two um, Studio Ghibli films set in Tama, um, one of which is Whisper of the Heart, which, to be completely honest, was one of the reasons I went to Tama. Um, Whisper of the Heart is just one of the best kind of depictions of a post-war like a modernist landscape, cityscape that there is. Like, um, you know, there's there's a boy who lives in the in the nice houses on the hill. There's a girl who lives in the flats down below. Um, you know, you can kind of guess where it goes, but it just it's done in enormous kind of detail, almost kind of Gregory's girl like levels of of um, you know of affection. Um, and the other one is, God, is it is it Pompoco, which is the one with the testicle dogs yes um and that one of course like that's about the construction of tama and about the um tanuki the kind of semi-imaginary they're based on actual animals but not those animals which uh, in mythology they become kind of like intelligent creatures of giant testicles it's very complicated anyway they live in the site of tama in the film and so try and stop the new town getting built mm. um, why wouldn't you <laughs> There's another interesting question that that's come up, um, <clears throat> which is inviting you. Given that you said before that the new towns somehow capture what uh, the governance of the moment thinks is how people ought to live, it wasn't quite what you said. Um, but um, I I wrote down a garbled version of that. Uh, given stuff is changing so much, um, <clears throat> what do you think uh, are likely to be the new town forms? That we might see that are, are now addressing um, climate change and and some of the other uh, more contemporary issues that face urbanism. I mean, there's probably that. Yeah, I think there's probably an argument for kind of more parasitic kind of new towns rather than new towns that are that necessarily are kind of built entirely freestanding away from other places. I mean, that would, you know, in terms of um, being able to, you know, there was a lot of talk today, again, as there always is about Brownfield site, building on Brownfield sites, being a big, you know, the, the government talking about building on Brownfield sites, like, you know, <laughs> that's all they've been talking about for, you know, it's all both, you know, colours of government have been talking about this, this whole millennia so far. So, um, you know, that, to some extent, uh, yes, you can do you can do that. Uh, you 
you know, but actually with new developments, it's very difficult to to kind of to see that as a sort of central plank of how you can do it. So I do think I do think there will be a kind of there'll be a move to kind of more parasitical stuff. You'd see that just in the kind of sprawl of some towns, you know. I mean, like I live, you know, living in Milton Keynes quite near Aylesbury. I mean, Aylesbury is now like the size of, you know, Jupiter. It's huge. I mean, it just goes on and on. I mean, you know. There's very little of the universe left that doesn't actually have an Aylesbury postcode, I think. You know, it's pretty much a way of free. So, you know, that, and I think there is a, I think there, you know, there's a kind of creeping, that was sort of what a lot of the new towns were sort of set up to stop happening, these kind of creeping giant towns that never stop. Um, and, but actually, I think some of the, you know, a bit like, it's very, very interesting, you know, hearing about, um, of that idea of you know that you've got this kind of linear town that just kind of fits into a, a slot before you get to the mountains you know the, you, that I think we're going to be sort of seeing more of that kind of development and less of the kind of big greenfield new towns you know that, that are just kind of spuriously kind of whatever shape the fashion of the day dictates. Didn't, didn't the last Labour government have some sort of plan of like 10 eco villages or 15 eco villages or something like that mm. of which i think they built about three yeah. one of them being the greenwich millennium village <laughs> um which i used to know very well and um it was kind of a weird slightly because in the kind of 2000s a bit of a weird kind of leftover space because you had the kind of ralph this quite pleasant ralph erskine designed bit around a nature reserve and the rest of it was still pretty undeveloped and there was nothing in the Millennium Dome. Mm. And then they just went for this absolute bonanza of extremely dense concrete flats with brick cladding on, which just filled the site completely. And, you know, it kind of mixed feelings about that sort of thing of like the density of something like that means, you know, most people in it will probably use public transport, et cetera, et cetera. But there's not anything particularly eco about let's take a partly green peninsula and just fill it with huge concrete frames. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of that peninsula was sort of, you know, has got such a weird checkered history of pollution and, you know, and, and stuff, isn't it? And then it's peculiar that that bit was actually a bit that actually wasn't that, you know, that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It was, it was very, it was very pleasant and very, and kind of weirdly quiet apart from obviously the fact that you're on the city airport flight path. Um, but yeah, there is something kind of, I guess, inherently not particularly ecological about starting afresh and building a new thing. I think you'll probably see when, you know, when, when things start to really go south, there'll be quite a lot of people who can afford it building their own towns, which run on, you know, a bit of infrastructure and a bit of water that they can control and no one else can get hold of. Yes. Um, and one could call that an eco town, but I don't think it's the one that you particularly want to have. No, sort of survival. Another, I mean, you made you made an interesting point about Tama being fairly um, hard nosed about knocking something down if it doesn't work, and and buildings being fairly transient and occasionally experimental. Um, Alistair Pitts is asking. Speaking of things that may be knocked down, what did John Owen think about uh, the the Point Cinema in Milton Keynes? I don't know how familiar you are, Owen. Um, anyway. The UK has never been very good at at um, people knocking things down that haven't worked. Um, they tend to point fingers of blame. But I think we're seeing here that um, there's an awful lot of uh, uh, love and longing to hold on to something people grew up with rather than to have it go the way of normal development sites. Yeah, I, I really like it. I think it's really, I, I mean, I like the fact that it's kind of like a bit of the kind of very Mies kind of Milton Keynes things that's been reassembled in a very un Mies way. It's like, what if we took a bit of one of these buildings and put it in a pyramid with a space frame around it and then put a multiplex in it? Like, it's really, I, I, I really liked it. I remember once talking to Christopher Woodward, who was um, obviously one of the main architects of the shopping centre and the railway station. Um, about, oh, you know, they're going to demolish the point. What do you think about that? And he was just like, meh. Like, you know, they were going to demolish the shopping centre over his dead body. Like, he was absolutely militant about, like, you know, I will not let these bastards touch it. But about the point, he was just kind of, 
Mm. Yeah, and I do think that's been a problem actually. Is that the, you know, the sort of the people that you would have hoped would have been the sort of high profile champions of it, you, you know, kind of actually haven't. You know, they didn't, they didn't sort of come forward and mm. and protect it in that kind of first wave of of stuff. You know, in the, in a way, you know, and so it is. It's like the most beloved new building, you know, sort of new town building in Milton Keynes by a long way, you know, and Milton Keynes did sort of get rid of Bletchley Leisure Centre, which was sort of a previous kind of, you know, beloved uh, modernist. Unforgivable, um, absolutely unforgivable. Um, in, you know, in the, you know, from a sort of earlier generation and people massively regret that, you know, that is, that is seen as a terrible loss, you know, that that happened in the same way that, you know, until the point gets demolished, the people that want to demolish it won't realise quite what they're going to lose. And, you know, actually people go out of their way to try and come up with an iconic building for it, for any given town or place now. And, you know, Milton Keynes has got one and it wants to knock it down. It's crackers. On which reflective point, I think we can uh, thankfully and, and um, stimulatedly draw the conversation to a close thank you both very very much for a, a stimulating hour we made you work your full 60 minutes <laughs> <clears throat> what a pleasure thank you for so having me I, I would suggest that everybody um unmute your microphones and give a conventional round of applause to our two stars so thank you very much thank you and I would remind people, um, as I said at the beginning, we've got quite a lot of events coming up online. Um, and we've also got the face-to-face -face event coming up uh, in April. And all of the details on that can be found on the website, www.mk.